Good morning. Good morning, everybody. It is my great, great pleasure to welcome you here today for the launch of the Time Collaborative. And we've got an amazing group with us today. Let me begin by recognizing Secretary Arne Duncan. Just sat down. You know, this is a man who has brought incredible leadership to the Department of Education and incredible passion, a dedication and commitment for children and their communities every single day. We are a lucky country to have him as our Secretary of Education. Thank you, Secretary. We are also extremely fortunate to have with us today the Governor of Connecticut, Governor Malloy, Governor Hickenlooper of Colorado, and representatives from Tennessee, from Massachusetts and New York, all five of the states that are joining us today in this public declaration and on the ground action around bringing kids more time to learn, more time in school. But these things don't happen by accident. These things require leadership. And I want to introduce as well, welcome as well, one of the true leaders in this movement, the head of the National Center on Time and Learning. It's unflagging, unflagging supporter for time for kids, Chris Gabrielli. Chris, welcome. This is a special day for the Ford Foundation. We've been a funder in education for a very, very long time, and we have witnessed extraordinary achievements along the way. You know, in the 1960s, Ford provided pioneer support for Head Start, a program that made an immense, immense difference for me. In 1967, this is how far back our work and time work runs. In 1967, I was one of the very first Head Start students in one of the very first Head Start classes in the South Bronx. That was about time. That was about giving kids time to learn. It was the very, very first environment I had ever been in in which English was the primary language. It's hard to believe. So, you know, I understand personally that there's no more important equalizer in education, no more important equalizer than having children spend more time in good schools with good teachers. There's no substitute. And let me tell you, this is the moment for this issue. States are beginning to step back from the austerity ledge. You've seen the data on tax collections and on budget changes, and are devoting, like they often do, more resources first to education budgets, thank goodness. It is vital that states and the taxpayers in those states think about what they're buying with those added education dollars, that those added dollars, which are already beginning to emerge in some of the states, be used for something tangible, something taxpayers can see and children can benefit from, something like a longer school day. And the argument's simple. It's not a hard argument to make. An investment in a longer day is an investment in the 21st century workforce and an investment in the future economic growth of this country. You know, a few years ago, Chris and I were just talking about uh, when he and I started working together. There were questions about whether more time for our children to learn was possible, whether we could get all the different constituencies together. And by the way, there were also questions as to whether we'd get results. But you know, we know the answer to those questions now. The research done by NCTL, by Roland Fryer at Harvard, and by others consistently demonstrates, consistently demonstrates what should be obvious. That when kids spend more time in school, they score better on standardized tests. They graduate at higher rates. And they're more likely to land internships, apprenticeships, and jobs answered. We don't have those questions anymore. It is possible, we're seeing it today, and it has results. We see it over and over and over again. But it's also pivotal to remember that as important as those education outcomes, and in some ways, this is the point I keep coming back to over and over again as I talk about this issue around the country, as important as those education outcomes are, the benefits of an expanded school day go far beyond, far beyond those outcomes that the researchers keep finding. Extended learning time is about the entire community. It's about matching the school day to better fit the work lives of parents. 
It's about giving teachers more time to plan their day, more time for professional development, more time to collaborate with colleagues. And you have to remember that in some ways most important, it's about the stark choice of the alternative. The hours between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. are the single most dangerous time of day for our nation's children. There are too many kids in communities around the country, urban and suburban, affluent and poor, in which those adult free hours are filled with crime, with teenage pregnancy, with drug abuse. Our goal has to be to turn those hours into time for opportunity with expanded curricula, reimagined school programs, internships and apprenticeships, greater exposure to things that we think of as things of the past, art, music, drama, and athletics. We have to find the time for those kids to be in that environment, not that alternative. But let me tell you we're making this happen. Let me remind you all that there are now a 1,000 schools and more than 500,000 students who meet this more than 300 hours a year standard. And it's not happening by accident. And I want to acknowledge other foundations, some of whom are here, who've made significant commitments on this front, some of them far longer even than the Ford Foundation, the Wallace Foundation, the Broad Foundation that has been at the center of so many terrific, terrific reforms, the Open Society Foundation, we at Ford collaborate with them in so many ways, Carnegie, and of course, the Mark Foundation. My hope going forward, my hope out of a day like today, is that we're gonna be able to find even more partnership from businesses who need this 21st century workforce, from nonprofits whose job it is to help these kids find safe spaces, and from individuals like many of you here. Now, the Time Collaborative is a terrific start to that. The launch of this collaborative is helping us showcase and will help us showcase even more deeply the work of governors and commissioners around the country as well as the Obama administration. Governors, commissioners, administration leaders who have driven this issue so well these last four years, who've taken this from an idea outside the bounds, something maybe not even possible, to something that is proven and something we know works. The growing focus on extending learning time has the potential to change entire communities for the better, making them safer, more livable, and self-sustaining environments, not just for our children, but for everybody. I can't tell you how important this is. I can't tell you how much these children benefit. And now I want to introduce a friend of mine, someone who's been central to this, no person no person has done more to bring this issue to the forefront than Chris Gabrielli. It is his passion, his dedication, and his commitment to giving school children the best and most well-rounded education possible, to give them the time to learn. It is his dedication that is the reason we're here today. So with that, it is my privilege to turn things over to Chris. Chris, thank you. Thank you, Luis, for your commitments and forge to dramatically improving the lives of children and families, for personally bearing witness to the impact in your own life, for making all of this possible. Ford's leadership here and your personal leadership here matters greatly. Good morning. The heart of today's event is the unveiling of the Time Collaborative, a public-private partnership involving federal, state, and local government, national and local philanthropy, a national nonprofit and local community organizations and local teachers unions. Together, we're committing to sustainably and cost-effectively bringing high-quality expanded learning time to schools serving high-poverty students who need and deserve that time in order to gain high academic skills and to enjoy a well-rounded education. Specifically, five states, Colorado, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, and Tennessee have agreed to adopt high standards for how to ensure expanded learning time is well spent and have initially enrolled 11 of their districts into this collaborative, where over 40 schools serving nearly 200,000, nearly 20,000 students, or aiming for 200,000, will convert to expanded learning time beginning next year in September 2013. We anticipate those numbers growing significantly in the following years. We know expanded learning time can be a fundamental game changer for schools and students. 
Today, our organization, the National Center on Time and Learning, is releasing our second census of schools across the country that have already made this report. You have a copy uh, on your seats. These school, we find over 1,000 schools now in 36 states and here in the District of Columbia that serve 520,000 students. That's an increase of more than 50% in schools and more than two-thirds in students served since our last census three years ago. But even as this growing group of schools proves every day how pow powerful a lever more time well spent can be, we are still moving much too slowly to give schools the time they need to succeed. Teachers want more time, parents want more time, community partners want to participate, and a growing body of public leaders starting so visibly with President Obama and Secretary Duncan are sounding the call. The time collaborative we are rolling out today represents the first scalable approach that could bring expanded learning time to huge numbers of schools and students unable to participate now. At the very heart of the collaborative are the schools where principals, teachers, community partners, and unions have agreed to seize the opportunity and who are engaged in a year of careful planning to select from proven practices and adapt them to the needs of their school, their students, and their community. While expanding learning time can be a cost-effective strategy, it does take resources to fairly compensate teachers and community partners. The policy core of the collaborative is the alignment of public resources to fund ongoing operational costs. Participating states are using new federal ESEA waivers to use existing federal funds more flexibly. By combining these with other state and local resources, time collaborative members are making expanded time possible and sustainable, all from public funds. These same strategies could be used in nearly every state across thousands of districts and schools, which makes this time collaborative a critical potential inflection point for the spread of this effective practice. Change, though, is hard. We at NCTL have learned how to help by providing deep ongoing technical assistance to hundreds of schools. With the generous support of the Ford Foundation, the Time Collaborative is able to offer considerable support to participating states and districts. This is an ideal public-private partnership. With public leadership and operating funds combined with private initiative and technical assistance, we can achieve these ambitious goals. Let me stress one final point. Our goal is not simply to expand learning time, though we are glad that next year alone we expect to achieve nearly six million more student learning hours. We need every minute of that well spent. We need students to gain the personalized academic support that makes all the difference to skill building. We need to infuse school schedules with enriching courses and opportunities in sciences, language, arts, music, drama, and sports, often delivered with community partners to ensure a well-rounded education. And we need to give teachers the time they need to prepare, to collaborate, to use data, and to hone their craft. Therefore, the time collaborative participants have all agreed to adopt a set of core design features and processes that we have identified as essential for success. For example, all of the participating schools will be adding at least 300 hours for all students enough time to really meet both student and teacher goals. They're all going through a year of inclusive and thoughtful planning, ensuring buy-in, preparation, and focus. Only those able to complete a strong plan will advance, and they have agreed to set accountable performance goals. They will be pursuing cost-effective tactics, such as staggering teacher schedules and leveraging community partners. They will redesign their whole day, not just add on to the existing one, and they will properly integrate learning time with other key elements, such as data-driven decision-making and more teacher collaboration. We are all determined to ensure that the time collaborative is as much about quality and impact as it is about expansion and growth. Today is a day to be optimistic and grateful. I want to especially thank our tremendous partner, supporter, and ally, the Ford Foundation, including their president, Luis Ubinas, their education leader, Jeannie Oakes, as well as their whole team. To Secretary Duncan and the whole USED team, thanks for extraordinary leadership and policymaking. To the governors and state off, uh, district union and community leaders gathered here today, the schools are already hard at work. Thanks for the determination to seize opportunity for students who depend on us to do so. And lastly, to my fa fabulous colleagues at NCTL, including my co-founder and President Jennifer Davis and a dozen colleagues, board members, and advisors gathered here today, thanks, and let's bring our A game to helping our new partners. Thank you very much.
We have representatives of all five states here. We're fortunate enough to have two of the governors here. I do also want to acknowledge later in the program, the Secretary of Education from Massachusetts uh, will be participating. And we have uh, two representatives from Tennessee and New York. Uh, Hansel Kang from Con uh, Commissioner Huffman's office is here. And Sally Backover from New York Commissioner King's office are also here. But let me now turn to the first of our governors. I'd like to introduce, you have the full bio, so I won't uh, take you through, the, through that because he'd rather have the time to talk about what he's doing. But Governor Malloy of Connecticut uh, is uh, made a, a big bet in Connecticut on the ability to, uh, through pioneering education reform legislation, to be able to provide enormous support to the districts uh, in Connecticut that need it most, and is wisely and interestingly merging the federal opportunity with those state opportunities. He's passionate about accelerating student achievement and closing the achievement gap. We are so pleased that he's leading off the discussion this morning. Thank you, Governor, for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great, uh, great to be with everyone. Uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your great leadership um, and uh, in support of the President's vision of what we need to do in the United States to better prepare uh, our children to be our workforce of the future. Earlier this year, I signed a comprehensive education reform bill. Actually, the Secretary came up that day. Uh, and I called it the uh, civil rights issue of our time, uh, this difference between achievement uh, in our urban or poorer school districts uh, and those that are not so urban or so poor. Connecticut has, in fact, a long and proud history as a leader in public education. But somewhere along the lines, we lost our way. Uh, we lost our edge. Uh, we began to lead in another more dubious uh, standard or category, and that is that we are the state with the largest achievement gap of any of the 50 states. When I was campaigning for the job of governor, uh, it was an issue I vowed to tackle, uh, and tackle after working with the legislature to, to stabilize the state's finances and work that work which continues today, and then we took on the issue of jobs and job uh, creation in our state, and then we turned our attention uh, to this issue as well. At the time when many states are cutting funding for education, we allocated more than $100 million in new funding, uh, the vast majority of that going to the 30 low-performing school districts that actually educate 41% uh, percent of our students out of a total of 165 districts. The education reform package that we passed created, among other things, alliance districts. Uh, which provide new resources to towns and cities that have the greatest need, those 30 districts. These districts, and, uh, these districts or uh, establishing these districts, encourage them to embrace key reforms and to accelerate uh, student success. Now, through the good work of, the, of our education commissioner, Stephen Pryor, and the hardworking educators in Connecticut, we are beginning to work on implementing that law. Uh, even as we navigate the financial challenges we face as a state, our commitment uh, to public education, to preparing our young people to compete in a 21st century economy remains absolute. So I'm pleased to be standing here today on behalf of our state and those education leaders who are committed to making the difficult changes necessary to prepare our students for success. Connecticut is proud to be one of the five states selected to participate in this time collaborative. We know our students and teachers need more time. Thanks to the Ford Foundation, resources and new funding flexibility from the US Department of Education and support from the National Center on Time and Learning, we are positioned to well accelerate our improvements. Starting in three districts, East Hartford, Meriden, and New London, Connecticut is on track to have an additional 3,184 students benefiting from expanded time next year. But just so that you understand that this is not the totality of our work to expand hours in our district, we have eight other districts that have already undertaken this year to extend additional time, although not to the 300 uh, level yet. Um, actually, all four schools uh, that we took over as part of our commissioner's network of low-performing schools, all four this year uh, are committed to extending uh, the school uh, year uh, and day uh, as well. Students in the communities that I'm talking about will have longer, uh, stronger school days that grants them the access to education that prepares them for success in their college careers and in the acquisition of life skills and job skills. Uh, education as we know, and I'm probably the best example of that, is the great equalizer. 
Uh, I hope that uh, in Connecticut we've made clear uh, that uh, regardless of the community you live in, regardless of the background that you come from, we will do everything to make sure that we don't simply offer opportunities, that we actually execute opportunities, that we do that which is necessary to make sure that all of our children learn the lessons that everyone in this room wants their own children to learn. This idea that we can tolerate different levels uh, of achievement based on geography or race uh, or wealth, our home ownership simply does not make any sense. In every one of the 30 low-performing school districts in our state, there is at least one outstanding school. So I ask every superintendent when I bump into them in those districts, tell me why every school is not that outstanding school in your district. This extension of time and school year will allow that to happen in district after district. Uh, I joked uh, earlier uh, in the beginning of this presentation, if we do all of this, who's going to bring the crops in? Uh, the, the, the reality is that we would not have designed this school day or school year if we had started our national history at a different time. So this is our time to change. And because of this program, it will happen in our nation. Thank you very much again, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for your leadership. You can see why we're so excited to be partnering with Governor Malloy and his team. We're also delighted that Governor Hickenlooper of Colorado is joining us this morning, not only as a leader in the effort in Colorado, but also now in his role as chairman of the Education Commission of the States. In Colorado as mayor and then as governor, he has prioritized education as he sees it as the foundation upon which the state's long-term economic prosperity and stability depend. Governor, thank you for joining us in Washington today. And Governor Malloy asked who's gonna bring in the crops, right? I can guarantee you if we don't rapidly change our education system, we won't be able to bring in the crops because when you go out there and see how it's done now, you need a level of technological expertise that we're not delivering. Uh, thank you, Luis, uh, for helping fund this and providing the leadership to support this. Uh, I remember when I met Chris Gabrielli, I was, it was three years ago, I guess, uh, in Boston and I was out campaigning and somehow we had mutual connections and he started wailing into me about the importance of a long school day and I didn't understand in Finland and South Korea. And I, I can remember leaving there saying, God, that sort of makes a lot of sense. And then every, as you go and look at all the different school districts, rural and urban and suburban, and, and you begin to assess what their different needs are, the one continuous uh, kind of uh, common theme that goes again and again is we need more time with the kids, right? Whether it's a rural school district, whether it's an urban school district, whether it's out in a, an affluent suburb, the, the kids, especially the kids that are coming from difficult neighborhoods, broken families, single parents, uh, that extra time with, with their teachers and within a structured setting means all the world. It means that allows them to continue the, the momentum they had the day before. It means they don't slip back uh, over the summer. Uh, it allows them to, to really deliver. Uh, I also want to recognize Arnie Duncan, who has provided at the federal level I think without question, the best education leadership we've had in this country in, in probably 100 years. I'll go, I'll go over the top. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 no, the, the, the race to the top competition, which I'm quick to point out, Colorado did not win, um, pushed the, 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 the acceptance of some of the basic premises of charter schools, of, of, of longer school days, uh, dramatically, and I don't think it's it's really possible to recognize or to to imagine what our country's education system would look like without uh, Secretary Duncan's efforts. I also want to recognize uh, Dr. Helene Jones, who's here from Colorado. She runs a, a Colorado Legacy Foundation. is a saint, uh, one of the most knowledgeable and hardest working uh, educational experts around. And, and although he's not here, Robert Hammond, our Commissioner for Education, is tireless in his efforts. Uh, I won't reiterate all the, uh, the, the points that, that uh, Governor Malloy made so well. I hate always following Governor Malloy. It's so unfair. Uh, but, but I agree with him. It is, a, it is a, uh, a question of social justice, that we can't allow zip codes to define a kid's potential, uh, that we 
need to give every child an equal opportunity at achieving their own potential. Uh, we look at this, we have uh, four Colorado districts uh, and, and they include Denver and Boulder and, and even though they're only about 28 miles apart, you could not have two more different school districts. Uh, but also Jefferson County and Adams County, again, two uh, equally different school districts. We'll have a little over 5,000 students participating. And uh, again, as Governor Malloy said, it's not just about the time. Uh, it, it is about uh, making sure that we take this opportunity to, to change the structure of how each school day works and how the, a child's time is utilized. Uh, one of the things when Chris Gabrielli was speaking now, but also I remember three years ago, that, that, that change allows you, to, to, allows you an opportunity to have a catalyst to dramatically change everything uh, in, a, in a much shorter period of time when you, make, when you find some fundamental change here. So we're looking at, at issues around how do we uh, do more blended learning? How do we use technology in an appropriate way with our schools? How can we use, uh, have more control over when teachers come in and when they leave? There's no, there's no real reason why all the teachers have to come in at the same time in the day and they all leave at the same time of the day. Some teachers come in early, other teachers come in later and then stay later. You extend the school day in a, in a, in a much more efficient way. And I think that's part of what we're going to look at in Colorado is, is to have a, a, a coherent look at how do we transform that experience, how a kid experiences a school day so that they, A, learn more at the moment, and B, are able to retain it, practice it, embed it in their, in their minds so it becomes useful going forward. Uh, again, I want to thank the Ford Foundation for so many years. As, as Luis was saying, that you know they've been looking at time and its various factors for so long, but also they've been looking at, at social equity and how can we have the gaps that we have in education and really are the first to, to stand up there and deliver. Speaking of blended learning, I hope you noted uh, that was the first public official I've ever seen who spoke from his iPad or <laughs> tablet device. Uh, now, that's, now that's daring. Um, we uh, are privileged to have with us and to be able to get remarks uh, from the person whose actions is at the federal policy making level make possible uh, this freeing up of resources, existing resources to be deployed, we think, more wisely and effectively. Um, we are uh, so pleased uh, that Secretary Duncan is uh, here today. We are so pleased that he will continue to provide the sort of leadership he and the department have done to this point, both in their actions and in their inspiration to all of us to take advantage of the opportunities served up. Uh, we are going to do an awkward thing and take a quick photograph with the group here since the Secretary has to leave promptly after his remarks. So I hope you'll excuse us in advance and also join us in welcoming Secretary of Education of the United States, Arnie Duncan. Excuse me, I'm thrilled to be here. And obviously, I'm preaching to the choir. I'm going to keep my remarks very, very brief and much rather have some questions with, with all of you. Um, this is obviously an extraordinary idea, an idea whose time has come, and I'll come back to that. But there are often great ideas that don't sort of go anywhere, don't move beyond the, the paper phase. And the reason I'm so hopeful, so optimistic here is the level of talent and commitment who's doing this work. Um, Luis and Chris are just world class in their leadership. Um, they are in it for the long haul. This work is not professional. This work is personal for both of them. Um, we have some governors who take education very seriously. We have others that don't. And these two gentlemen here and the three who are represented who aren't here are amongst the five, I don't say this easily or lightly, amongst the five governors who I have the most respect for because they have spent so much time and energy and resource and political capital to drive change. And uh, because he's not here, I'll tell a quick story on Governor Haslam, who's one of the five. And I met with him very early on. He said, Arnie, every governor talks about being the education governor and very rarely does education change in their states. And he said, how can I do something different? How can I walk the walk and not just talk the talk? And that level of honesty and integrity, I think, is what all these five governors have. And they are, in this initiative, they are walking the walk. Um, I don't think there's also a coincidence that Massachusetts has led the country in education for a while, and Massachusetts has also led the country in extending time. I think what the governor has done and what you've done, Paul and others, um, there's a serious correlation here and appreciate the continued leadership in this effort. Um, just to reiterate a couple points folks have made, we've talked about the achievement gap for a long time in this country. What I'm trying to focus the conversation on is not the achievement gap, but the opportunity gap. And I'm convinced if we close the opportunity gap, the achievement gap goes away. And that's easier said than done. One of the most important things we can do is give those children who may not be blessed of a household full of books, 
who might not be blessed with a family member who has gone to college or even graduated from high school, we have to give them the time to learn more. And this initiative is, is a huge opportunity to do that. And if we can start to close those opportunity gaps and do it in a high quality way, as everyone emphasizes, the goal here is not more time. The goal here is more learning. Um, that is hugely, hugely important. And I don't want to understate or underestimate what Louise talked about in terms of student safety. And when I led the Chicago public schools and 90% of my kids came from the minority community, 85% lived, lived below the poverty line, we are working very, very hard to raise graduation rates and reduce dropout rates and increase achievements. Um, but probably my most difficult battle was keeping my children safe. And we had one child killed due to gun violence every two weeks. We had 25 to 30 kids killed every year, a staggering number. And knock on wood, none of those kids were killed during the school day, and almost none of them were killed at 12 at night or 3 in the morning. It was at 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock, 3 o'clock to 7 o'clock. And I kept on my wall a poster that a young man gave me as a picture of him as a fireman. And he wrote, if I grow up, I want to be a fireman. And this idea of if I grow up, not when I grow up, is not something that I grew up worrying about. And if we're serious about talking about college and talking about AP calculus and physics, we have to make sure our children are safe. And those hours, 3 o'clock to 7 o'clock, are times of huge anxiety, huge stress. And if we can have high quality programming during that time, not just giving our students the academic enrichment, but the social and emotional support, they start to talk about when I grow up, not if I grow up, their whole ability to think long term changes in a very fundamental way. So we want to be a great partner. We want to continue to cheerlead this. Um, this is, I think, a huge step in the right direction. But I also want to challenge us that I think we're frankly moving as a country far too slow. And so Chris talked about going to a 50% increase over the past three years in the number of schools ex extending time. That is encouraging, but we are also at now about 1,000 schools. We have 100,000 schools in this country. And do 100,000 schools need this? Honestly, no. But do a lot more than 1,000 schools need this kind of opportunity for children, for teachers, for parents, for principals? The answer is yes. And hopefully if we can sort of measure the results and learn what's working and what's not, collectively we can dramatically speed up the rate in which schools are adopting these practices. They're so much better for children, so much better for the adults. So look forward to a great conversation, but thanks to Chris and Louise for your leadership. Thanks to the governors here and to their teams. And I think collectively we have a chance to lead the country in a very, very different direction. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Duncan. I know that uh, time schedules are short, but there is an opportunity for some uh, quick question and answers that the Secretary uh, or other panelists have agreed to take. Uh, can I start with any questions from the media? Any questions from the audience in general? Back here, right back here. There's microphones available. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, any plans on this going, at, at which point would you consider this uh, as a national plan? I know right now it's basically a pilot program. But when would you consider this pushing this for a national movement? So we have been trying to push this as a national movement for a while. Um, what you see now is, I think, some real creativity and innovation, public-private partnerships, political leaders, foundations, nonprofits working together. And I think this is the kernels of a national movement. As I said earlier, we have a long way to go, but the caliber of leadership here, and I'm convinced the kind of results we'll see over the next couple of years I think will compel the country to act in a very different way. So I think we're at the start of something really, really important. But it is, we, are, we are in our infancy. We have a long way to go. Any timeline for that? Uh, again, we're trying to start now. We're trying to start now. Another question right back here. Hi, um, I'm Elena Silva with the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Um, I've looked at this issue for a long time, and I'm a big supporter. I don't think there's anything more important than what you all have just said about um, kids needing this kind of rich dynamic learning in those hours. Uh, I'm curious to know from you, Secretary, what you see as a relationship between uh, this movement and other efforts to, to bridge school and community, promised neighborhoods, as a pretty small competitive grants yeah. program compared yeah. to others. Yeah, well, I, I think these are all part of the fabric, and people keep asking what the magic bullet is of silver hand. You know, there isn't one. And uh, we have to do all these things simultaneously. But the idea of schools being islands separated from the community, the idea that I had in many of my Chicago schools when we started, where they literally, literally, the adults swept the kids out of the schools and into the streets at 2 and 2.30, um, that mentality has to change. 
and you heard people talk about partnerships. Schools can't do this by themselves. Bringing in the local service, uh, social service agencies and nonprofits and churches and business communities and mentoring and tutoring and academic enrichment. The idea of schools being community centers, open much longer hours with a richer way of activities, not just for children, but for parents. G GED and ESL and family literacy nights and family counseling. When schools become the hearts of neighborhood and where not just children, but family members are learning together, those kids are gonna do just fine. Hi, my name is Kim Jones, and I'm the Executive Director of uh, Advocates for Justice in Education. We're the Parent Training and Information Center here in D.C. We um, support parents and children with special education needs. Um, and I, when I, I heard the, a lot of the press talk this morning about the extended school day, and I was really curious to look at what the model was, which is why I'm here today. And when I looked at this, to me, it, it's not rocket science. Um, independent schools have this schedule. My kids went to independent schools. I mean, this is a schedule that really, quite honestly, is, com is, a, is completely doable. Um, my, my question, particularly um, being here in the district and some of the challenges that we're having, particularly with the special needs community, as well as just you know attempting to close the achievement gap is, um, you know, what incentives are there to really develop some coordinated practice standards around this work because part of what I see um, here is, for instance, like the special needs community, like the sure. parent centers, the department funds that, but we are completely disconnected from some of that. And a lot of the kids who are in these urban centers, you know, are being, are being um, pushed into special education at well, some level because they're, they're not getting that extra support. Let me take, a, let me take a crack at that. I think yeah. that's a great question. Two, two quick comments I'd make. Of course, there's a much sure. more to it, and I hope we'll get a chance to have this. a dialogue with you, off, you know, offline here. But number one, that's why a year of planning is so crucial. If you're going to change a whole school and think about all the populations, all the needs, you, know, you need to think that through carefully. We now have done it in enough schools around this country that we know it can be done, but it needs to be done fun, thoughtfully. Expanding learning time is mostly about personalizing. And of course, for special needs kids, it's the most important. But so it is for kids who are advanced and want more challenging work, and kids who are struggling, and kids who are English language learners. There are many different populations in schools, particularly in urban schools. And it's the individualization that it gives kids really the chance to rise to that. The other thing I want to emphasize is the need in that planning process to involve the full range of communities who are engaged in a school. When schools try to do this without doing that, it doesn't work very well. When schools do a great job of bringing in community partners, parents, families, you know, the kids themselves, uh, everyone who's got a stake in this to rethink what's possible throughout the day for the students, you see tremendous gains. Okay, one more question. Jacqueline Barnett, former Secretary of Education for the City of Philadelphia, now working for Paul Vallis in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Thank you, Governor, for your remarks. Um, I sort of want to piggyback a little bit on what the, the lady just said about, in some ways, it's not rocket science. We know that those kids who live in affluent communities, they go to school after that, they do soccer, right, and then they do piano lessons. So in some ways, it does mimic that, and that's the thing that works, right? It's what works in Lower Marion. We pay $24,000 per student in comparison to 17,000, say, in Philadelphia. My question is, having worked as a cabinet member, one of the things that we find is that there are a lot of institutions like, say, the Philadelphia Museum for Art, or art organizations that receive government support. Is there a way to incorporate them into this as a partnership because they are a natural resource in our community? Thank you. Sure. Uh, I think we're both eager to answer that, and I think all of us are eager to answer it. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, a very large percentage of expanded learning time schools, and we provide a lot of information that, on that on our website, do incorporate partners, both traditional uh, after-school and out-of-school time providers who often think comprehensively, but also very often specialized providers, people who work on just arts or just you know, robotics or just a specific thing that really can be exciting. And in elective time, it gets even more sophisticated. In elective times where schools add that and you have outside partners who are uh, on contract to provide that is part of why schools are then able to give teachers more time to collaborate, to plan, to, we were at a, one of the best turnaround schools in the country in Boston that the secretary talked about, Orchard Gardens the other day, and the teacher was emphasizing the vast increase in the amount of collaborative time the teachers have while the students are in engaging electives. That's a win-win. Uh, thanks for the uh, uh, question. I, I think that, that and, and 
piggybacking on the uh, point that the secretary has made, we're not going to get from 1% to 90% overnight. And, and there's so much work that has to be done in, in community after community in coordinating after school activities uh, so that they actually represent high quality activities that are educationally based and reinforce the message, uh, including the work done in, in the classroom uh, when, 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 when the child otherwise comes from the, the, the school building uh, or, or goes to a different part of the building where the afternoon program is run by some third party. So there's a ton of work to do in all, all of this uh, in, in regard. Uh, you know, I, I was mayor for 14 years of a city. Eight, nine years ago, we began a collaborative effort to improve the after school programs across the board by all of the providers. And it's that kind of work that will allow us to close the gap in other ways. But uh, uh, time, uh, meaning quality time, in a school uh, is by far the most important thing we can do. It's one of the reasons that, you know, as mayor of the city of Stanford, we went to universal pre-K as well. Um, these are important things. These are important investments, and we have to continue to make them. I would just quickly add that I think a couple of people said this is not rocket science, and it really isn't. This is like a triumph of common sense. But the fact of the matter is, as a country, we have not taken this step for a long time due to sort of adult intransience. And um, I keep saying we have 100,000 schools in this country in rich neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods, black, white, Latino, you name it. They all have classrooms. They all have libraries. They have gyms. They have computer labs. Some have pools. And they don't belong to the principal or to the superintendent or to the board. They belong to the community. And we have not historically used these phenomenal physical assets beyond sort of six hours a day, five days a week, nine months out of the year. It makes no sense. To directly answer your question, there are so many nonprofits and social service agencies who want to partner. I've met very few who don't. I think we in education have frankly not sort of opened our doors and said we would like to partner. We'd like to bring you into our schools. We think that's an asset. And sharing space is complicated and you get into real basic fights about cleaning up and toilet paper and other things like that. <laughs> And those are the real issues that unfortunately historically have stopped this from happening. And if we can get past those type of situations, this will become the norm much quicker than it has in the past. And I'll just throw out, just because I, we got into a discussion two weeks ago, that 50 years ago or 60 years ago, parks were generally part of schools and school playgrounds were part of parks. And now you see, for various legal reasons, you see fences around them all the time. And I remember when I first became mayor back in 2003 in Chicago, I was visiting Richie Daly. And Mayor Daly looked at me and says, I hate, hate chain link fence. And you know, we have consistently, at least in Denver, tried to reduce, get the fences down, open up the playgrounds for all, you know, all week long activity. We also have tried to get to your point about the the, the cultural institutions, we have a program four by four where we, by the time a, a kid is four years old, we want them to have had four experiences in, in either the art museum, the museum of nature and science, all of our culture, the zoo, our cultural experiences, and they have agreed, all you have to do is ask them, but they give free passes to every kid under four. If it, you know, uh, it's supposed to be need-based, but it's too much trouble, so they just make it, for little kids, you come in free. Thank you very much, Secretary Duncan. Thank you, Governor Hickenlooper and Malloy. Thank you, partner and President Ubinas. Uh, if we're going to uh, now transition to the next part of the program, so thank them all, please, for joining us this morning. <laughs> <laughs>